This is the Elements of Science Fiction video series, and in this video, we're finally going to look at a definition of what science fiction really is. And if you've seen my other videos, you know that making stories relevant to our real lives in this real world is what good literature is all about. And science fiction uses science and the potential of technology as a vehicle for doing just this. Damon Knight once said, science fiction is what we point to when we say it. It can be that easy or simply a matter of futuristic stuff and aliens, and we could just leave it there. But the purpose of this video is to be restrictive for the purpose of making a distinction between thoughtful, meaningful, and inspiring stories and those which are just pandering or facile. So this definition aims to identify the broader value that good science fiction storytelling provides by ascribing meaning to our world. When trying to create a definition for pretty much anything, it's important to look at the borders. What is the smallest thing that qualifies as science fiction? And what excludes it? Why is a movie like Star Wars not science fiction? Well, Star Wars is a kind of space opera, and I'll explain in part two of this series why it's really not science fiction as far as I'm concerned. For me, science fiction is defined as follows. When a currently non-existent, unreal or undiscovered, I use the term fabulous often, technology, or biology impinges upon and affects the lives of the characters in the story. So breaking that down, two things have to occur. Rule one, some fabulous element is introduced into the story that simply doesn't exist in our real world and that something is explained by technology or an unknown biology. This bit about biology, I'll have to go into that in more detail here in a second. But rule two, this currently non-existent in the real world something is actively affecting the lives of the characters because when it is not, then it's just incidental or arbitrary and this means the focus of the story is not really on the science or the ideas but on something else. For instance, if you simply replace conventional guns with laser guns, that's not good enough to call something science fiction unless it matters that they are laser guns because science fiction involves the dealing with these things. Take it from science fiction godfather Ray Bradbury, who defines it like this. Science fiction is any idea that occurs in the head and doesn't yet exist, but soon will and will change everything for everybody, and nothing will ever be the same again. As soon as you have an idea that changes some small part of the world, you are writing science fiction. It's always the art of the possible, never the impossible. Allow me to back up. Rule one. First, there, of course, has to be a fabulous element whatsoever, something that doesn't exist. If the story involves things that currently exist, well, then it's just not science fiction. Batman and James Bond movies operate on the border of this. All of his gadgets, both of their gadgets, are plausible inventions or slip just over the edge into science fiction. When a fabulous element is not attributed to or explained by technology or biology, we are in the realm of fantasy. When the fabulous element is not attributed to or explained by technology, or some biology, we are in the realm of fantasy because it is just an alternative universe, where oftentimes the fabulous element isn't even explained at all, or it's attributed to magic, such as even in Star Wars we have the Force. Now, interestingly enough, as a side note, George Lucas hastily invented these midichlorian things as retroactive continuity, kind of proving my point, having been invented for the sole purpose of attributing the Force to something scientific rather than just magic. Another major paradigm of the supernatural is attributed to mythology, which includes Judeo-Christian canon, and this serves as a catch-all for angels and demons and hell and heaven and anything else that attributes the fabulous element to folklore or tall tales. Think Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Supernatural TV show. This is the branch of fantasy. Sometimes the fabulous element, just some creature that is biologically plausible but yet undiscovered, and I'm talking about extraterrestrials, but also creatures that have evolved through natural scientific forces on Earth itself. This too is a type of science fiction. Take the movie Contagion, which involves a virus that doesn't exist, but could exist, and this is science fiction because we are made to understand how it could come into existence by natural forces, but more importantly, how it's affecting the lives of people in the movie. But when the fabulous element is not explained at all, well, that too falls into the realm of fantasy or mythology, just as you might find in an episode of The X-Files. Rule one is all about explanation. 
And yes, sometimes it's hard to explain or it can be contradictory. I found it kind of funny how Looper dealt with the serious problem of paradox in time travel movies. It's too strange. Your face looks backwards. Yeah. So do you know what's going to happen? You've done all this already? As me? I don't want to talk about time travel. Because if we start talking about it, then we're going to be here all day talking about it, making diagrams with straws. We both know how this has to go down. I can't let you walk away from this diner alive. And this introduces a kind of science fiction I like to distinguish from actual science fiction by calling it token science fiction. Good examples of stories that exist on the boundary of sci-fi due to just barely following rule one are superhero movies. Is Superman sci-fi? Well, yes, but only because we understand his powers are inextricably linked to him being an extraterrestrial and the quasi-scientific action of kryptonite upon his physiology. X-Men attribute the supernatural abilities of the characters to a genetic mutation, and this is a natural scientific force, and it is explained scientifically, however enormous and implausible their powers may be. Fantastic Four even more so. Some kind of cosmic energy just hit them, and then they have these ridiculous powers that defy the forces of nature. The arbitrariness with which superheroes ascribe their power has been well satirized in popular culture, my favorite here being radioactive man from the simpsons uh, my pants uh, caught on barbed wire good lord choke an a-bomb becoming radioactive from this day forward i shall call myself radioactive man so that's how it happened I once we move beyond attributing the fabulous element to science, well, rule two is about how much does it matter? Could this story otherwise exist without the fabulous element, or if we just replaced it with currently existing technology or biology? Or could we have otherwise not explained it at all? Science fiction explores how the world has changed due to the introduction of the fabulous element, how the lives of the characters, and I would say humans here, but they don't have to be human, are directly affected by this fabulous element. If you just throw antenna on all the characters and say, there, they're Martians, but it doesn't mean anything, then it's not science fiction. But it's using science fiction elements to pander to the audience or to borrow from the popularity of science fiction. A good example of this kind of pandering is in this movie Monsters, which bills itself as science fiction and tells us the monsters are extraterrestrials, but it might as well have just been magic, it might as well have been guerrilla soldiers. To sum up, we can think of two major genres that are distinct, and between them we have token science fiction. In sci-fi, in true sci-fi, we have a new technology or a new biology, and the plausibility of its existence is crucial to the plot, just as Ray Bradbury said, as it, its effect on the characters and the outcome of the story is what's important. In token science fiction, yes, we are told the fabulous element is explained by these things, but it really isn't essential, or it's explained in some obligatory or cursory manner, and it could be replaced by something we already know about our current world. And we distinguish this from fantasy by when the fabulous element is attributed to magic, psychic power, sixth sense, telekinesis, or a host of legacy magic that belongs to existing mythology. It's fair to mention that the fabulous elements such as angels and demons and heaven and hell are mythological and no different from ghosts or goblins or fairies or genies or chupacabras or whatever. And often with fantasy, the fabulous element gets no explanation whatsoever. It's just taken for granted, either because we know we are in an alternate universe or it's just an artistic effect. History is a helpful guide. Science fiction was born into this world about the time people started to look at science as something more than a curious parlor trick, as something potentially threatening. This is why so many people attribute Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the first ever work of science fiction. The scientific reanimation of a corpse, and then the trials and tribulations of Dr. Frankenstein coming to terms with such potential technology, this is central to the book. And in the movies, it becomes a little bit more about the monster who is coming to terms with the fact that he is this monster. Practically coinciding with this story, at the time of Mary, Frank, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is Hoffman's The Sandman, which explores the possibility of artificial intelligence in an incredible way. Fast forward to modern filmmaking and we see the biggest paradigm shift occur in science fiction's rise to popular acceptance in the late 1970s and it's after the surprise commercial success of Star Wars Episode Four. 
And this is a good era to focus on, to see science fiction enter the mainstream in both literary and trivial ways. And so in part two of this video, I'll further explore these borders and discuss examples that begin with Star Wars and why it is not science fiction. Oh boy, is that going to be controversial.